Next, we have Dr. Doug Jabs, who is joining us from Baltimore, who is going to talk about therapy and prognosis of white dot syndromes. Okay, these are my financial disclosures. Um, they're not really relevant to this talk, and almost everything we do is off-label. So here's the answer, um, but we'll go through them one by one. The first two, ampi and mutes, typically are self-limited diseases, not requiring therapy, with a reasonably good to a very good prognosis. Birdshot, multifocal, and serpiginous are all chronic diseases, very poor prognosis untreated, and require immunosuppression, typically initiated early. And PIC has a highly variable course, sometimes can be treated with only anti-VEGF, but sometimes requires immunosuppression. So let's start with the top, AMPI. If we look at this, uh, and this is from a review that came out a couple of years ago, you can see that about three quarters of the patients end up with 2040 or better visual acuity, and only 5% of eyes end up 2200 or worse. Note the next two lines, which is the use of medical therapy, typically corticosteroids. There is not much difference in the visual outcome, at least in retrospective studies. Although there may be some bias in the way in which these studies are reported, nevertheless, there's little evidence for the benefit of steroids in AMPI. In MUDES, uh, we heard earlier that the, it does well. Again, when we look at the visual outcome uh, from the variety of pay, uh, studies, the average follow-up visual acuity, or the mean, is just slightly off 2020, and about 95% of the eyes end up 2025 or better. So again, a very good visual prognosis without treatment for this disease. Now, for the next few slides, we're going to talk about longitudinal data analysis. It's a time-updated analysis that enables you to evaluate treatment effect over time uh, and looks at patients as blocks of time uh, on and off treatment. The first disease that was analyzed was birdshot chorioretinitis, and as we know, almost everybody given sufficient time, if you look at the graph on the, low, the uh, left, gets macular edema. They also get progressive visual loss, which we'll come back to. In this analysis, we discovered that corticosteroids were effective at treating the macular edema, but it recurred at a dose typically of 15 milligrams a day or less. That's too high for long-term use. Long-term use over a period of years must be at a dose of 7.5 milligrams a day or less. So, however, in this study, immunosuppression reduced the likelihood of macular edema by 83%, a highly significant benefit, and suggested that if you're going to treat birdshot, you should start with uh, oral corticosteroids and immunosuppression. We also were able to demonstrate using quantitative Goldman visual fields that patients would be losing field prior to coming into treatment, but with treatment you can reverse field damage, although not always normalize it. You also can see resolution of the spots on uh, ICG angiography, and you can see resolution of the damage to the ellipsoid zone uh, on OCT. So these suggested that patients with birdshot benefit from immunosuppression and should be treated with immunosuppression uh, at the outset along with corticosteroids. The visual prognosis of birdshot is markedly improved if you start early. The longer the disease is untreated, the worse the visual the presenting vision uh, in these patients. Multifocal choroiditis with panuveitis is a, has, again, very, diff, uh, very poor visual prognosis untreated. If you look at the uh, series from Hopkins, you can see that about half the eyes presented with visual impairment, although bilateral blindness was somewhat less. In this study, again, oral corticosteroids uh, were not effective. At high doses, above 10 milligrams a day, they were effective at reducing the likelihood of structural complications. But at low doses, under 10, they were not, suggesting that, again, you could not use steroids alone long enough in these patients. Conversely, immunosuppression was markedly effective at reducing the likelihood of structural complications with, again, an 83 percent benefit, significantly benefit, and was markedly effective at reducing the likelihood of blindness by over 90 percent. The suggestion, again, given the ineffectiveness of low-dose steroids, is that if you are going to treat, you should start your therapy with immunosuppression as well as oral corticosteroids. Now, punctate intercoriditis has a highly variable course. This particular case was seen prior to the uh, use of anti-VEGF. He spontaneously remitted and spontaneously involuted his CNV and never needed any therapy. Today, he would obviously be treated with anti-VEGF for the CNV. 
Conversely, there may be patients who have a chronic course, particularly bilateral CNV and bilateral CNV that seems to persist despite anti-VEGF therapy. Those patients do benefit from the use of immunosuppression. And as you can see in the table on the right, as long as you can get the, the uh, disease completely quiet, you can markedly reduce and significantly reduce the likelihood of choroidal neovascularization. CNV, as you can see in the two series from the University of Iowa and from Johns Hopkins, is very common in these patients and is really, really the, the complication that drives therapy for patients with PIC. If we look at these two series again, uh, series from the University of Illinois at Chicago and another one from Hopkins, one can see that most patients maintain visual acuity uh, of at least 2040 and at least one eye uh, with this disease, and that the rates of blindness uh, are uh, low but not zero. And there is some suggestion that, again, immunosuppression started early uh, results in uh, preservation of vision by eliminating the recurrence of new CNV. We looked at Mount Sinai uh, a couple years ago at our ability to treat three of these diseases, uh, multifocal choroiditis, PIC, and birdshot with immunosuppression, and we found that over a two-year period we were able to maintain their vision, and that patients with birdshot we were able to increase their visual field uh, on these patients. We were also successful at getting the patient's prednisone dose down to levels that were low enough uh, for long-term use, and this was with the use of immunosuppression. However, note that we had to often go to maximum dose of immunosuppression, and that at least 20% of our patients required two immunosuppressive drugs in order to achieve these results. Serpiginous has less good quality data. Nevertheless, the available data suggests that without treatment, this is a progressive disease, ultimately bilateral, and ultimately resulting in visual loss. In several small series, one can see that the use of immunosuppression while they're on immunosuppression has uh, been associated with arresting the progression of the disease and preventing relapses. Alkylating agents are highly effective, but we rarely use alkylating agents anymore because of the potential for long-term side effects, including an increased risk of malignancy. Nevertheless, chronic immunosuppression does appear to improve the prognosis in these patients. How do we approach it? This happens to be my approach. I start with prednisone, a milligram per kilogram per day, up to 60 milligrams a day maximally, and I start with mycophenolate. You can use methotrexate. Both of them are equally effective at maximum doses, as recently demonstrated in the FAST trial. I taper down as outlined here. This is uh, the reference below, gives you exactly how this is used. And you often have to maximize the dose of either drug. If I, that doesn't work, I tend to add a second drug. I currently add tacrolimus to that regimen. If tacrolimus is ineffective, I switch it out for adalimumab ad in addition to the anti-metabolite, either mycophenolate or methotrexate. If that fails, I then move to the fluosinolone acetonide implant, although there are some increasing data that perhaps tocilizumab may be of benefit in some of these diseases. Having said that, Nobody really knows if this approach is the best, and indeed many people would use adalimumab earlier. There is now a randomized controlled clinical trial being conducted, un, uh, funded by the National Eye Institute, as to exactly when adalimumab should be introduced into uh, this regimen, and this trial is now open and enrolling, and it's being conducted at the clinical centers listed here in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. So. To sum up what I just said in the past few minutes, AMPI is generally a self-limited disease. There is no real evidence that tr medical treatment helps the outcome of the eyes. They can, you can see patients with a CNS vasculitis or a systemic vasculitis who have an AMPI-like picture in the eye. Those patients, you need treatment of the vasculitis often with corticosteroids and immunosuppression. The prognosis is good but not excellent. MUDES is a self-limited disease spontaneously remitting with an excellent visual prognosis. Birdshot, multifocal, and PIC uh, are diseases that can do well if, uh, rather, and serpiginous are diseases that can do well if treated aggressively with immunosuppression early. PIC has a somewhat variable course, but often requires, as was noted earlier, uh, compound therapy with both anti-VEGF and immunosuppression. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jabs.